William M. Leo Grande, Back Channel to Cuba, The Hidden History of Negotiations Between Washington and Havana. Dive into the fascinating and tumultuous history of negotiations between the United States and Cuba. As detailed in William M. Leogrand's Back Channel to Cuba, The Hidden History of Negotiations Between Washington and Havana. This book summary takes you through crucial moments in the relationship between the two nations, starting from the 1959 Cuban Revolution and the initial cautious optimism of both parties, to the various covert operations, secret back channel negotiations, and diplomatic ups and downs that ensued. Uncover the key events, policy shifts, and political contexts that have shaped the complex and often strained dynamics between these two powerful nations. U.S.-Cuba, a troubled relationship. The discord between the United States and Cuba dates back to the Cuban Revolution in 1959. Fidel Castro's rise to power after overthrowing U.S.-backed Fulgencio Batista led to an uneasy beginning between the two nations. While initial efforts were made by both Castro and the U.S. to establish goodwill, the relationship eventually soured due to incidents such as President Eisenhower's public snub of Castro, Cuba's nationalization of large estates, and the ousting of political moderates. This paved the way for the CIA's secret operations to depose Castro's government. Much of the turbulence in U.S.-Cuba relations began with the Cuban Revolution in 1959, when Fidel Castro and Che Guevara toppled authoritarian leader Fulgencio Batista, who was heavily supported by the United States. Though they were initially cautious, both Castro and the U.S. sought to make amends. Castro's goodwill tour of the United States in April 1959 aimed to signal the potential for positive relations between both nations. The U.S. even considered offering financial aid to the fledgling Cuban government. However, Castro, determined to forge an independent Cuba free from U.S. influence, refused to ask for any economic assistance. An incident that further soured the relationship was when President Dwight D. Eisenhower chose to go golfing rather than meet with Castro during his visit to the U.S., a perceived snub that left Castro feeling insulted. Upon his return to Cuba, Castro implemented socialist policies, nationalizing all estates larger than 1,000 acres on May 17, 1959. This move directly upset U.S. investors with significant holdings in Cuban agriculture. Further amplifying tensions, Castro removed centrist politicians from the upper echelons of his government and replaced them with radicals and communists. As a culmination of the deteriorating relationship, by November 1959, the CIA commenced covert activities aimed at overthrowing Castro's government. The intricate historical roots of the U.S.-Cuba conflict highlights the shortcomings of these efforts and the complicated landscape of international diplomacy. The Turning Point U.S.-Cuba relations. As Fidel Castro established his new government, tensions between Cuba and the United States heightened, reaching a boiling point in 1960. Despite attempts by then-U.S. Ambassador to Cuba, Philip W. Bonsell, urging President Eisenhower to be patient with the new Cuban administration, events such as the suspicious explosion of Belgian cargo ship La Cobra and a trade partnership between Cuba and the Soviet Union fueled distrust. As a result, the Eisenhower administration initiated covert operations to oust Castro, escalating economic pressure on Cuba. After Russia intervened by offering support, the United States closed its embassy in Cuba to mark the end of their diplomatic relationship. When Fidel Castro formed his government, the United States had already harbored concerns, and the situation between the two countries continued to deteriorate. A significant moment occurred in February 1960 when Cuba and the Soviet Union entered a $100 million trade agreement, triggering a long-lasting and uneasy relationship between Cuba and the United States. Despite Ambassador Philip W. Bonsell's appeals to President Eisenhower for patience and understanding for Castro's government, the situation escalated on March 4, 1960. An explosion on the Belgian cargo ship La Cobra in Havana's harbor killed 15 people and injured 200 more. Castro blamed the explosion on the CIA, further damaging any hopes of reconciliation between the two nations. 
Ignoring Bonsell's advice, Eisenhower ordered covert operations to overthrow Castro. The U.S. imposed economic sanctions by refusing to buy Cuban sugar, leading Castro to nationalize all U.S.-owned land and businesses in response. Tensions increased when Eisenhower cut off all exports to Cuba, except for food and medicine. Seeing an opportunity, Russia stepped in, offering to purchase Cuban sugar. This led to a symbolic embrace between Castro and Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev at a United Nations meeting. For the U.S., this alliance was unacceptable. On January 4, 1961, the Eisenhower administration officially closed the U.S. Embassy in Cuba, effectively marking the end of their diplomatic relationship for decades to come. JFK's Covert Cuban Conundrum At the height of the Cold War, John F. Kennedy looked at various strategies to handle Cuba's independent and growing relationship with the Soviet Union. The Bay of Pigs invasion, a disastrous U.S.-backed attempt to overthrow Fidel Castro, led to a full economic embargo and further covert operations against Cuba's regime. While Kennedy explored possible assassination plots, he also sought a secret negotiation track to improve U.S.-Cuban relations, with Che Guevara offering the first sign of diplomatic hope. In the midst of the tense Cold War, Cuba emerged as a powerful, politically independent nation with strong economic prospects. Its budding relationship with the Soviet Union concerned the United States, especially since prior to the revolution, U.S. investments in Cuba had been larger than anywhere else in Latin America. The strained relationship between the U.S. and Cuba reached a breaking point on April 17, 1961, when President John F. Kennedy authorized the Bay of Pigs invasion. This covert operation, designed to overthrow Fidel Castro's government, involved 1,500 trained Cuban exiles backed by the CIA. The plan, however, was a catastrophic failure. As Castro's forces captured 1,200 prisoners and thwarted the invasion, a humiliated Kennedy chose to impose a full economic embargo on Cuba. Despite the embargo, Kennedy didn't abandon hope of finding a solution for the Cuban dilemma. Kennedy and his attorney general brother Robert, launched Operation Mongoose, a secretive plan aimed at isolating and impoverishing Cuba to provoke an uprising against Castro's regime. While the CIA was tasked to devise a possible assassination plot, including the infamous poison cigar idea, Kennedy simultaneously instructed his administration to develop a secret rapprochement track as a means to negotiate with Castro. Unexpectedly, the first indication of such secret negotiations came from Che Guevara, a staunch supporter of Castro's regime. During the first meeting of the Alliance for Progress in Uruguay, Guevara presented U.S. White House aide Richard Goodwin with a box of Cuban cigars for Kennedy. This symbolic token of goodwill hinted at Guevara's desire to resume negotiations and potentially restore U.S.-Cuban relations. Donovan's Prisoner Exchange Triumph Following the Bay of Pigs debacle, the U.S. sought the release of 1,200 prisoners from Cuba. They enlisted expert negotiator James B. Donovan, who had previously secured a successful prisoner exchange from East Germany. Under Robert Kennedy's direction, Donovan navigated challenging discussions with Fidel Castro. Although the emergence of the Cuban Missile Crisis initially disrupted negotiations, a secret dialogue was maintained through the Brazilian government. After Nikita Khrushchev unexpectedly agreed to withdraw Soviet missiles, a slighted Castro showed newfound readiness to engage with the United States. As a result, Donovan's relentlessness and skill ultimately led to the prisoner release in exchange for a substantially reduced sum of cash as well as food and medicine provisions. Bridging the Cuba-U.S. Divide In the early 1960s, lawyer James Donovan and Cuban leader Fidel Castro embarked on conversations that laid the foundation for a developing friendship. Despite the White House instructing Donovan to demand Cuba to cut ties with the Soviet Union before normal relations could resume, Castro expressed his interest in continuing negotiations. Donovan shared a joke with Castro on how the two nations should handle the situation, comparing it to porcupines making love, very carefully. Donovan later introduced Castro to TV news reporter Lisa Howard, who helped foster hope for normalized relations between Cuba and the United States through her TV show. 
The White House eventually provided Howard a direct communications channel to Cuba, paving the way for further peace talks. In the early 1960s, lawyer James Donovan and Cuban leader Fidel Castro found themselves navigating the choppy waters of diplomacy. Following the release of Bay of Pigs prisoners, the two engaged in a series of talks that built a mutual friendship and a hope for continued progress. As 1963 began, Donovan and Castro worked together to exchange U.S. and Cuban prisoners, creating a positive atmosphere for their diplomatic efforts. During Donovan's visit to Cuba in April, the two enjoyed leisure activities together, strengthening their bond. Despite these encouraging steps, the White House insisted that Cuba must break its ties with the Soviet Union before normal relations with the U.S. could begin. Undeterred, Castro expressed his determination to continue negotiations, but was unsure how to proceed. Addressing the sensitive political climate with wit, Donovan joked that both nations should proceed like porcupines making love, very carefully. To maintain the momentum, Donovan introduced Castro to TV news reporter Lisa Howard. The two got along well, and Castro agreed to appear on her show to discuss possible routes to reconciliation between their countries. The interview, which aired on May 10, 1963, garnered nationwide attention and marked a significant step forward in their progress. Encouraged by her growing influence on Cuban-American relations, the White House eventually granted Howard her own direct line of communication to Cuba. This breakthrough allowed her to facilitate further discussions, including a potential meeting between Castro and William Atwood, a magazine editor and advisor to the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. The unwavering efforts of Donovan and Howard set the stage for a cautiously optimistic dialogue between Cuba and the United States. Hopes Dashed, Kennedy's Assassination President Kennedy had initiated a back-channel dialogue with Fidel Castro through French journalist Jean Daniel and Lisa Howard to transmit a message of hope towards improving U.S.-Cuban relations. However, the assassination of Kennedy thwarted these efforts. As Lyndon B. Johnson took office, the new administration turned towards pursuing aggressive policies against Cuba, fueled by Cuba's alleged assistance to armed revolutions in Brazil and Venezuela. Despite Castro's certainty of better relations, Johnson tightened the Cuban embargo and travel ban, resulting in thousands of Cubans fleeing the country. This forced the nations into public negotiation for the first time in years, organizing the Cuban refugee airlift and creating a path to citizenship for over 260,000 Cubans. Nixon's Stance on Cuba Richard Nixon's presidency was marked by his strong opposition to Fidel Castro and Cuba. Despite facing an epidemic of plane hijackings, Nixon would not cooperate with Cuba to find a solution. Many of these hijackings were carried out by Castro's supporters, seeking asylum in Cuba. Cuba expressed its intention to prosecute the hijackers and extradite them to countries that had negotiated terms, but Nixon maintained his refusal to negotiate. This puzzled his Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, especially since Nixon had made progress in negotiating with Communist China and many Americans favored normalizing relations with Cuba. As Latin American nations restored trade agreements with Cuba, Kissinger saw the need to re-evaluate the U.S.'s stance. In 1974, amidst Nixon's Watergate troubles, Kissinger secretly approached Castro for back-channel talks, indicating a potential shift in U.S.-Cuba relations. Stalled U.S.-Cuba Diplomacy Following the Watergate scandal, President Gerald Ford and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger made efforts to improve relations with Cuba through secret meetings. However, progress was hindered by opposing expectations, Cuba demanded the U.S. lift the blockade, while the U.S. wanted Cuba to reduce their pro-revolution involvement and ties with the Soviet Union. The impasse intensified when Cuban troops were sent to support the Soviet-backed People's Movement for the Liberation of Angola, MPLA, causing Ford to halt negotiations. In persisting attempts at secret diplomacy, U.S.-Cuban relations further deteriorated when Cuban embassies were attacked and a Cuban airline was bombed by exiles with former CIA associations. Castro insisted the U.S. address these attacks as a condition for reopening talks. Carter's Diplomatic Cuban Struggle 
Jimmy Carter sought a new approach to addressing the tension between the United States and Cuba in 1977 by encouraging trade and commerce rather than imposing restrictions. He also established what was essentially an embassy in Havana, without actual diplomatic recognition, and initiated talks to normalize relations. However, progress stalled over the issues of Angola and Puerto Rican independence. As Cuba's economy declined, prompting more citizens to flee, Castro warned the U.S. against treating Cuban refugees with leniency, but his pleas were ignored. In response, he allowed thousands of Cubans to take to the sea, hurting Carter's re-election chances. As Jimmy Carter began his presidency in 1977, the challenges of Cuban exiles in Angola still weighed heavily on U.S.-Cuba negotiations. Holding a distinct perspective, Carter believed that fostering change within the communist state would be best achieved by opening it up to trade and commerce. He consequently halted spy plane missions over Cuba and established an interest section in Havana, which closely resembled an embassy without possessing official diplomatic credentials. Cuba reciprocated these efforts for peace, as Castro recognized dual citizenship individuals and released additional U.S. political prisoners in a gesture of goodwill. Yet again, when demands were made by the U.S. for Cuba to alter its foreign policy regarding Angola and cease support for Puerto Rican independence, an impasse was reached, with Cuba taking offense at the notion of catering to U.S. preferences. Towards the end of 1979, Carter faced another Cuban predicament. Gripped by a severe economic recession aggravated by crop and livestock epidemics, a wave of desperate Cubans turned to violence and hijacking boats in their attempts to escape. Despite Castro's warnings not to show leniency toward such individuals, U.S. policy continued to openly welcome Cuban refugees. Castro threatened that failing to address these criminal acts would result in further crises. Ignoring these warnings, Castro enabled thousands of Cubans to sail for Florida through Mariel Harbor in April 1980. Though the Coast Guard intervened, around 80,000 Cubans managed to enter the United States. The media coined the incident the Freedom Flotilla, which greatly harmed Carter's chances for re-election. Reagan, Castro, and Tense Diplomacy The 1980 election of Ronald Reagan with his aggressive policy towards Cuba fueled tension between the two countries. Castro, seeking cooperation, stopped supporting guerrilla armies in Central America. Despite hostile attitudes, the Reagan administration negotiated with Cuba regarding excludables or Cuban immigrants with criminal records. Despite attempting to initiate further discussions, Castro was met with the U.S. launching a subversive radio station. As the Cold War faded and Russian aid to Cuba ceased, the Bush administration believed it was just a matter of time before Cuba's issues resolved themselves. Ronald Reagan's election in 1980 marked a shift in U.S. policy towards Cuba. With a more assertive strategy, Reagan was willing to enforce embargoes, sanctions, and even contemplate military invasion. Fidel Castro, in an attempt to maintain non-threatening relations with the new administration, ceased sending support to guerrilla armies in Nicaragua and El Salvador. Despite hostility, the Reagan administration had no choice but to cooperate with Cuba on the issue of excludables. These were thousands of Cubans with lengthy criminal records who had entered the United States. Prior to this, there was no policy in place dictating how they should be returned to Cuba. In 1984, the U.S. finally addressed the matter through formal discussions. On December 13, 1984, the U.S. and Cuba reached an agreement returning 2,746 excludables to Cuba and granting the country an immigration quota of 20,000 people annually. Although Castro hoped for extended talks on other pertinent issues, no further discussions took place. Instead, the U.S. launched Radio Marti on Cuba's Independence Day, May 20, 1985. This subversive radio station aimed to create dissent against the Castro government. As the Cold War came to an end and the Reagan presidency gave way to George H. W. Bush's administration, the fall of communism loomed. By 1991, most communist governments were collapsing, and Russian military aid to Cuba would cease by January 1992. In the eyes of the Bush administration, Cuba's issues would resolve, all they needed was time. 
Clinton's Cuban Conundrum In the 1990s, winning Florida was crucial for securing the U.S. presidency, and Bill Clinton understood engaging Cuban Americans was key to getting their votes. Signing the Cuban Democracy Act, Clinton tightened the embargo against Cuba, but his administration sought ways to improve relations. By working around the act, Clinton's administration loosened some travel restrictions and facilitated cultural exchanges. When the Balsero crisis emerged in 1993, thousands of Cubans fled their country in handmade rafts, pushing Clinton to find a resolution. Fidel Castro communicated through Nobel laureate Gabriel Garcia Marquez that they needed to discuss both the embargo and their overall relationship. Clinton vowed to tackle other issues if Castro halted the immigration influx, a move that would aid Clinton's re-election bid. Turbulent U.S.-Cuba Relations While Castro reduced migration by September 1994, Clinton faced obstacles in his second term with anti-Castro demonstrators and brothers to the rescue, BTTR, a Miami organization, dropping propaganda over Cuba. Castro asked the United States to stop these flights, but the U.S. did not act. In 1996, the Cuban military shot down two BTTR planes, leading to the Helms-Burton bill that gave Congress power over lifting sanctions against Cuba. A collaboration opportunity arose in 1999 when Elian Gonzalez, a young boy from Cuba, was found off the Florida coast. Despite debates, the U.S. Supreme Court decided to return him to his father, causing Cuban-American riots and impacting the 2000 presidential election. With Castro agreeing to Clinton's terms, migration fell drastically before the September 1994 elections. However, when Clinton embarked on his second term, anti-Castro demonstrators and the Miami Group, Brothers to the Rescue, BTTR, began intensifying challenges. BTTR flew over Cuba and littered anti-Castro propaganda. Castro had been urging the U.S. in 1994 and 1995 to halt illegal flights, otherwise, Cuba's military would intervene. Regrettably, the U.S. remained passive, and on January 22, 1996, Cuban military forces shot down two BTTR planes, causing four casualties. Consequently, Congress passed the Helms-Burton Bill, depriving the president of authority to lift sanctions on Cuba. Hopes of ameliorating U.S.-Cuba relations during Clinton's presidency shattered. However, in November 1999, the two governments had an opportunity to cooperate. Elian Gonzalez, a five-year-old Cuban boy, was discovered on an inner tube near Florida after his mother and ten others perished when a smuggler's boat sank. U.S. authorities initially placed Elian under his uncle's care. But when news emerged that Elian's father was alive in Cuba, a heated debate ensued. Cuban Americans argued for Elian to remain in the U.S., whereas the Cuban and U.S. government favored reuniting him with his father. Ultimately, the U.S. Supreme Court ordered Elian to return to Cuba. Regrettably, this decision sparked Cuban-American riots, influencing Vice President Al Gore's loss of the Florida vote and consequently the 2000 presidential election to George W. Bush. Bush vs. Obama on Cuba George W. Bush showed no desire to negotiate or enhance relations with Cuba and implemented policies that increased pressure on Castro's government. Conversely, Barack Obama advocated a change in the U.S.'s long-standing policy towards Cuba. As Obama aimed to improve relations, he enabled cultural exchange and updated telecommunication lines between the two countries, which would later prove disadvantageous for Cuba. During his presidency, George W. Bush followed in his father's footsteps, showing no interest in negotiating or enhancing relations with Cuba. Instead, he introduced two initiatives targeting Castro's government. On Cuban Independence Day in 2002, Bush revealed the initiative for New Cuba, which aimed to foster democratic regime change. Castro responded by securing a petition with 8 million signatures, declaring Cuba's socialism untouchable. In 2003, Bush introduced the Commission for Assistance to a Free Cuba, which further restricted U.S. travel to the island nation and encouraged subversive activities against Castro's government. A new approach emerged with presidential candidate Barack Obama, who promoted a policy change towards Cuba. 
In 2007, speaking in the staunchly anti-Castro neighborhood of Little Havana, Obama declared the need to change the U.S.'s failed Cuban policy. His message resonated, contributing to his victory in the 2008 election. As president, Obama facilitated cultural exchange and improved telecommunication lines between the U.S. and Cuba. However, these advancements would later prove unfavorable for Cuba. A Rocky Path to U.S.-Cuba Relations Although initial efforts in the Obama administration to improve relations with Cuba faced setbacks, signs of positive change emerged during Obama's second term. Covert attempts to promote democracy in Cuba in 2009-2010 led to the arrest of American Alan Gross and heightened tensions between the two nations. Nonetheless, the release of a Cuban five-member, resumption of postal services, and formal discussions on migration suggested progress. A public handshake between Raul Castro and Barack Obama in 2013 signified the importance of the steps taken towards rebuilding diplomatic ties. As the Obama administration entered office, many were optimistic about a change in policy towards Cuba. However, initiatives aimed at bringing democracy promotion to Cuba did not pan out as expected. The administration allocated $20 million to support anti-Castro bloggers and sent Alan Gross to bolster covert networks among dissidents, leading to a tense situation. Gross's arrest and subsequent 15-year sentence roused political visits and attempts to renegotiate good faith between the U.S. and Cuba, but to no avail. Despite these early challenges, Obama's second term saw breakthroughs in U.S.-Cuba relations. High-ranking officials like John Kerry and Chuck Hagel publicly committed to policy changes, and tangible progress began to emerge. The U.S. released René González, a Cuban Five member arrested in 1998 for conspiracy, reflecting a mutual easing of tensions. Reinstituted postal services and reopened dialogues on migration marked further advancements in the relationship. A watershed moment took place in 2013 at Nelson Mandela's memorial service when Raul Castro, the Cuban president, and Barack Obama shared a public handshake. This seemingly small gesture held immense significance, considering the history of secretive communication between U.S. and Cuban leaders. The handshake symbolized the progress made and underlined the hope for better diplomatic ties and a brighter future for U.S.-Cuba relations. In wrapping up our journey of the secretive history of negotiations between the United States and Cuba, we have observed the intricate dance of threats, reconciliations, and shifting political landscapes that have painted this complex relationship. Backchannel to Cuba lays bare the truth behind these diplomatic maneuvers and highlights the significant personalities who, despite numerous obstacles, strive for normalized relations between the two nations. As history unfolds and the chances of improvement in U.S.-Cuban relations ebb and flow, this book offers a clear and in-depth understanding of the foundations and influences that have defined one of the modern world's most intriguing international relationships.